Collective. Our collective comprises six North Shore libraries, Bayville, Glen Cove, Gold Coast, Locust Valley, Manhasset, and Oyster Bay. Together, we offer monthly genealogy programs. Tonight's program, Genealogy A to Z, a trivia adventure, is sponsored by the Bayville Free Library. Our presenter is Thomas McEntee, and here's a little bit about Thomas. Thomas is a baby boomer guy with a love of punk rock music, but also art history, who somehow fell into the technology industry almost 40 years ago, and then left a lucrative IT career to pursue his love of family history and genealogy. Technology and historical research are opposites, but tech people like Thomas are needed to guide today's genealogists through the maze of options so they can deploy the best apps and devices to break down research brick walls. Thomas McEntee, author, educator, advocate, entrepreneur, and that genealogy guy who helps you accomplish your family history goals. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Thomas. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so much for this, and uh, thanks everyone, and this is uh, great. I'm just getting back into doing webinars after taking some time off. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, also, for those of you that are just joining us, let me get over here. There we go. Uh, we are posting, or I can uh, continually post a link to the handout. Uh, we didn't want to send it out ahead of time, and the reason is this. It would give away and spoil all the fun. I'm going to be asking a bunch of questions during this presentation, uh, and hopefully you, you will know the answers, and if not, you'll learn the answers. The handout, I believe in uh, actionable education, meaning you should have a handout that's more than just an outline. The handout will have resources and links, and you should be able to go to the same sites that I'm showing. So relax. You don't have to write anything down. Have a good time. Uh, you might want to take some notes in terms of ideas. Uh, but we'll be posting the link to the PDF handout occasionally. Uh, so it is Genealogy A to Z, a trivia adventure. I do want to let you know that it is copyrighted material, but I'm pretty liberal with my copyright. Uh, I Feel free to hand out the PDF to other genealogy friends. Take it to your genealogy society. We are recording this, and I believe uh, that Lydia is going to uh, make sure that this is available via YouTube. Uh, I am a steward for my knowledge. I cannot take this with me. Uh, my mother, who was a single mother, raised me on the abundance uh, method, which is you can't hold on to what you have with a tight fist. Your hand has to be open to accept the next good thing coming your way. So that is my philosophy in terms of education. So we're going to go through here. Just a little note. I am a New Yorker. I was born in the Catskill Mountains up in Sullivan County in Liberty, New York. I escaped uh at age 17 i used to call it walton mountain and uh i went to george washington university from 1980 84 and have a degree in art history and spanish made uh literature uh and then i lived in san francisco for almost 20 years and i've been here in chicago since 2004 and so uh but let's get started and also i want you to feel free to use the chat to ask questions at any time because i'm of an age where if i don't ask right away uh, I'm going to forget it, but I will answer your questions uh, when we get done. And also, I'll make my email available at the last slide. So if you think of a question later on, you can always ask me. So A is for archives. So here's a question. What is the best online resource to locate archives with primary source materials in the United States, Canada, and Australia? I'm hoping my librarians there know this. If you don't, it is Archive Grid. Archive Grid is part of OCLC, which also is part of WorldCat. Let's go ahead and take a look. Oh, come on, guys. There we go. Uh, this is Archive Grid. You can actually see the archives. It, it uses a Google API for maps, and you should be able to put in here, and it's, it's probably running slow, uh, but it will show you what you're looking for. So I can go ahead here to, uh, let's go to New York, uh, and we can go... And all of these, you know, if I wanted to see Bard College, I could go there and go to the site. For some reason, it's not resolving. I may have to log in, so I don't know about that. Uh, but the thing is, I could say uh, Glen Cove, uh, New York. And it will go ahead and it should be able to show me uh, things that mention that, New York Public Library. I mean, it's an amazing site and this is free, folks. Most of the stuff that I'm gonna show tonight is free. So you should be able to search for people's places and events with Archive Grid. Uh, and I don't know, it, I'm pretty sure that Chrissy, Lydia, you, all of you guys uh, probably know this, 
but uh, just in case you didn't. So that's our first resource. Bees for birth records. Here's a question. What is a delayed birth certificate? And can it be used to secure a pass US passport? If you don't know what a delayed birth certificate is, uh, I'll give you an example of my mother-in-law who was born in Greece in 1933. When she escaped the Greek Civil War and she came over, I believe, in 1949, she didn't have a birth certificate. She was born in a very rural area on a mountain. And so her mother and uh, Maria, the daughter, had to go to the priest. And the priest did an affirmation, sort of a, a deposition or, you know, a certificate saying, and, and, and he asked Maria's mother, when, when was Maria born? She said, oh, about the epiphany. So that's January 5th or 6th, you know, so they, that was her birthday became January 10th. But then you can take that and you'll see that commonly in some states, they allowed what's called a de delayed birth certificate. It has to be notarized and it's based on someone's testimony that they knew of the birth of that person. And the resources, uh, U.S. State Department has a lot of information on what is a delayed uh, birth certificate if you've never heard of it, okay? And so it goes through this whole uh, this whole process, and I it, it, it's really kind of interesting if you don't know it. It comes up more in the South, uh, and I've, I've encountered it more with uh, people that are immigrating uh, to the United States. I'm going to close this resource. Great. Uh, let me see. Are we in need of posting our? Uh, there we go. I just posted the syllabus again for you guys. Uh, here we go. C is for census. When will the 1950 U.S. Census be released and will there be a searchable name index? Now, this uh, the census has already been out. I will tell you, the census was released on April 1st of 2022 last year. OK, if you don't know the rule, there is a privacy rule, a 72 year hold for the U.S. Census. So that means the 1960 census will be available on April 1st, 2032, because April 1st was a census day. Now, if you haven't researched the U.S. Census, a lot of sites have it for free. Uh, and so you can search them. They're all indexed. It was amazing this time when the National Archives released it. Uh, Ancestry Family Search had already started using artificial intelligence to do handwriting, to analyze the handwriting and actually create an index. It wasn't perfect, but it was a great start. Uh, I started getting ready for the 1950 census back in 2020 around this time. And so this is a great resource. Uh, my mother was in it, she was born in 1941. It was her first census. Uh, and it really gives you a snapshot of what life was like on April 1st, 1950. D is for disasters. Okay, what's the most common disaster in the United States impacting access to records for genealogy research? Do you know what it is? It's actually fire. There is a whole section at FamilySearch. And if you don't know FamilySearch, familysearch.org, it's a free resource. Uh, the thing is they have a whole article in their wiki on burned courthouses uh, and how to research them. You have to wind up looking for substitute records. Some of it was from the Civil War, uh, but actually, I believe in Wisconsin, we just had a courthouse burn two, three years ago. You have to realize courts, a lot of the records are not digitized yet. Uh, and so that is the big impact. And you start having to look. They have a list of all the counties with record loss. Uh, and it is pretty amazing and devastating. Uh, but that is something that you will run into. People call it a brick wall. But if you know how to use substitute records... In fact, one of the biggest fires, the anniversary is tomorrow, July 12th, 1973. The National Personnel Center in St. Louis, where all the military records were stored, had a major fire. That is why you can't find a lot of enlistment records except for the U.S. Navy. Luckily, World War I draft cards and World War II draft cards are National Archives. Uh, but, but fire, I think, is one of the biggest things. E is for evidence, and I'm going to take a little sip of Coke Zero here. What is evidence evaluation or evidence analysis, and why is it an important part of the GPS? And I don't mean location, genealogical proof standard. Let me tell you something. I've been doing genealogy for 45 years. I started in January 1977 when the miniseries Roots came on television, and I was with my great-grandparents who helped raise me. 
and we'd watch each episode, turn the set off, and then we'd talk about our own family history. But back then, I was a name collector. You know, if I had a birth certificate and a death certificate, to me, I treated them all the same. So basically, evidence is there are four parts to it. There's a great site called Evidence Explained. This is a great lesson. Again, all of these resources, folks, are on the handout. And we'll post the link there again soon. This is what Evidence Explained looks like. So you have sources. A source can be original or derivative. Most times, like an index. If you're working with an index, well, someone had to look at the original and, and in, enter that information. You know what happens then? Room for error. Information. It's either primary or secondary. This means primary is, let's say, my great-grandfather's World War I draft card. He filled it out. He filled out his birth date. That's primary. It's in his own hand, and he signed it. Secondary, that would be like uh, a death certificate. Usually, when someone dies, there's an informant. It could be the wife. It could be the child. Uh, they were not, maybe if you're trying to prove a birth date, the death certificate will say it, but it doesn't mean that that informant was there at the birth. It's secondary, okay? And then finally, evidence. One thing that's not on here, by the way, is clarity. I, clarity is one of the areas that I look at. Can I read the record clearly, or do you have to guess at letters and words? And then finally, this is the most important evidence, direct evidence or indirect. And let me explain what that is. Let's say I'm trying to prove the birth date of my great-grandfather, John Ralph Boston, born up in Lewis County, Watertown area. He was born January 31st, 1896. I found his World War I draft card. It has his birth date. That is direct. It's directly stated. Now, indirect would be this. Have you ever encountered a tombstone for someone, and it'll say that their death date was blah, 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 age 80 years, seven months, and five days? right? And you're like, great, now I have to do math. No one told me I had to do math and genealogy. And by the way, I subscribe to what Barbie says. Barbie said, math is hard, let's go shopping. But if you have to back engineer something, that's indirect. There are actually sites that let you calculate that death date and that year, year to come up with a birth date. So that's the difference. This is a really great resource overall. But evidence... Uh, evidence evaluation really makes you a better researcher. F is for females. What is one of the best resources, book, website, or record set for locating female ancestors in the U.S.? This is an amazing book. I have it. I could pull it off my shelf right now. The Hidden Half, it is probably 20 years old. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not still valuable. Uh, this is a paperback book. Uh, and yeah, I did purchase it. And it's a source book. Oh, 1999. So 23 years, 24 years. This is an amazing book. You cannot get this in Kindle. Uh, there's no other way to get it. It very frequently sells out. Uh, and actually, uh, this is a yeah, this is on sale right now. But this is what I use. And it goes through every resource for U.S. research involving females. And I really uh, highly recommend it. G is for GPS. I think you know what I mean by that. What does GPS stand for in genealogy? And what organization maintains the standards for GPS? So when we talk genealogy, GPS is the genealogical proof standard. It is maintained by the Board for the Certification of Genealogists and the BCG, uh, they've just celebrated their 50th birthday a few years ago, but this is what the GPS looks like. Uh, yes, I agree, your cookies. Uh, here we go. And I hope you can see this. I can bump this up a little bit here. Okay, these are the five steps. You wanna do a reasonably exhaustive search. You can't just find the first birth record and say, oh, I proven the birthday. I found nine birth records from different sources from my great-grandfather, and one of them was not correct. Uh, complete and accurate source citations. Citing your sources is not to impress your genealogy friends. It is a way of saying, I can find this later on, or this is how I found it. Thorough analysis and correlation. That's that evidence evaluation. Resolve conflicting evidence. So I had one record out of nine that was incorrect. I determined it was an index and that the person creating the index 
had just copied the information incorrectly. And then write a written conclusion. You don't have to write War and Peace. From my great grandfather, this is what it said. John Ralph Austin was born on January 31st, 1896 in Lowville, Lewis County, New York, based on uh, primary, primary information on the World War I draft card dated June 6th, 1916. Okay, and that's it. So I've proven it. Then I go on to birth location and the other thing. So don't think that this has to be onerous or a lot of work, but again, it makes the quality of your research better. As I was discussing with Lydia before, you know, I've been doing this 45 years. Sites like Ancestry, they have gamified genealogy, right? They make it fun. Build a tree, do the work for us, click the shaky leaf. And what do you have after searching for four hours? You know, I want to leave a legacy for my family. I want to make sure that I have everything there and that it is proven. H is for handwriting. We're get, making our way through the alphabet, and I think we're doing, yeah, we're doing pretty good on time. H is for handwriting. What's the best resource for deciphering handwritten records used for genealogy research? Well, it's actually, again, I'm going to go back many times to the Family Search Wiki. Family Search has a free wiki with over 100,000 articles. It looks just like Wikipedia, but it's just genealogy. Look at what they have here. Is, yeah, they actually have samples of things pulled, and they have Old English. They have a secretary hand, if you don't know what that is. Uh, these, this is secretary hand. Uh, this is Old English. And they have all of these things so that you can actually start comparing this is one of the best resources uh, in this area. They also have paleography, early, early American handwriting games, speaking of gamification. But again, this is great, Old English Guide, A to M. Uh, and this would go through. So this is really a great resource. This is always up to date and current. Uh, and again, I rely, professionals rely on this as well. Okay. Ready for intellectual property. What is intellectual property? Well, it's anything that you know you create. Uh, it's copyright. Uh, how do you determine whether a record, like a vital record, a high school yearbook, is protected by copyright and if you can still use the record for genealogy research? So how do you do that? Well, it's easy. Uh, American Library Association, uh, which I love, and their conference was here this summer, I believe the end of June, and they have amazing tools for copyright. They actually have something called a copyright slider. And it goes through the public domain slider. And it goes through and it says, you know, basically if it's published before 1923, then it's fine. Notice all of these. Yeah. So this allows you to understand. Now, the basic rule that I go ahead and I, I swear by is that I'm doing research. I'm doing scholarship. So I can actually quote the work. A lot of times I try and contact the author. Can I use this if I'm using a photo or something? But you're able to do this. This is how you build your source citation. If you've ever done a research paper in high school or college, footnotes, remember? You've got to have those primary and secondary sources. So for the most part, you don't have to worry about it. But you can't just take a photo, believe me, off of ancestry from someone's tree and put it on your blog or put it on your own tree if it maybe it was taken in 1950. You know, there are rules about that. Everyone thinks that the internet, you know, if it's on the internet, I had one person tell me it's in the public domain. It's not. I don't want you to get so worried about copyright that it hinders you from doing research, but you should know how copyright, I actually had busted someone this week. Uh, they were taking content from Family Tree Magazine and posting it on Twitter. Uh, and I think it was more just ignorance and the person didn't know it wasn't willful. Uh, but again, copyright is a big, a big area. J is for Julian calendar. Oh, what is that? What is a Julian calendar or old calendar and how does it impact genealogy research? Well, the Julian calendar is the old calendar that was in use up until about 1752 in England and the US. Uh, believe it or not, Greece was the last country to move off the Julian calendar in 1923. Uh, and again, we'll go back to Family Search Wiki. 
Uh, they have a great article here uh, that goes through. Actually, there were riots because they lost 10 days. They moved 10 days. They had to change the calendar because it didn't account for like leap years and everything. So this is the great explanation. Uh, and it has all the dates. And I believe if I'm right, uh, where's Greece? Probably, yeah, 1923. Uh, and it tells you the country. So you may see dates. I'll give you an example. George Washington, I believe, was born February 22nd, 1732. But that was on the new calendar. He would have been uh, born, I think, 10 days earlier on the 12th under the Julian. So you may see that. You may see the split uh, where it will give two years, like 1748 slash 49, uh, et cetera. So I just want you to be aware of that. K is for kinship and cousins. What does kith and kin mean? And are they blood relatives to your ancestors in terms of genealogy research? Have you ever heard of kith and kin? Uh, I know kin, kinfolk, but what is kith? Well, it's all about putting in context. Uh, usually kith would be something, uh, it would be people that, well, we have a term called the fan club, F-A-N, friends, associates, and neighbors. Let's say my great grandmother, born in 1894 in Manhattan, lived in a tenement in the Lower East Side. Uh, and anyone else that was there, uh, they may have known, that may have been in their social circle. Let's say you have a German ancestor like my Hennebergs that came here in 1891 through uh, uh, Castle Garden uh, because Ellis Island didn't open until 1790, uh, 19, no, 1872. Uh, so they came in in uh, 18, uh, no, 1892, I'm sorry. So they came in 1891. They lived in a tenement. What I would do is I go to, through the census roll. Who else spoke German? Who else maybe came from the same area, Saxony in Germany? They probably knew each other. Uh, my third great grandfather was an upholsterer. Who else was an upholsterer in that set of records? So that's called uh, the fan club. It's called cluster search. Uh, and so this has a really good evaluation of what kith is. Those are usually not blood relatives. Uh, have you ever had an aunt or an uncle that you call auntie or uncle and they weren't really related? It's just that they were good family friends. That's what that term stands for. L is for lost and found. This is interesting. What method did Irish immigrants to the United States use to connect with families and relatives who had arrived earlier? There was no Twitter. There was no TikTok. There was no threads. Uh, you know, when the majority came through, uh, I think my uh, second great grandmother, Bridget Farron, came over about 1881. Uh, there is something called the Boston Pilot. There were advertisements placed by people from Ireland saying that they were looking for someone. New York had it as well in newspapers. Uh, now you do need an ancestry subscription for this, but it was called Missing Friends. And that's basically what it was. If I wanna go and yeah, this is a common name, Slattery. Uh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say location, I'll do Boston. Uh, Suffolk, Massachusetts, go ahead and search. Uh, oh, I do have an account. Sorry about this, and sign in. And uh, this is what they look like. You can go ahead and view the record, and they are newspaper records. That's it, you know? So if you didn't know this and you're stuck, you know, maybe living in Boston, uh, left his home last July. These are interesting. I find them interesting reading, but I'm kind of a nerd. But that is something that you want to know about. It's called Missing Friends. Uh, the Boston Pilot was an Irish newspaper in Boston, but don't think it was only Boston people. Uh, they would carry these advertisements that people paid for from all over the U.S. M is for mortality schedule. Oh, death, death, death. What is this about? What is the mortality schedule in certain U.S. census records? Well, the U.S. census did what were called non-population schedules. They had one for agriculture, for business. They also did a mortality schedule. Take my second great grandfather, uh, David O'Keefe, who died January 2nd, 1870, uh, 1870. Yes. 
Uh, he fell into a tanning vat. I think he was celebrating New Year's. He was a security guard. Uh, so what it is, they had a mortality schedule for the 1870 census, which was done in June 1st, 1870. What the mortality schedule did is it took account of all the deaths in that enumeration district for the previous year. Okay, so it's 1850 through 1855. Uh, but the nice thing is you learn what they died from, how old they were. Sometimes it even lists the physician. It depends on uh, the enumeration district, but these are really valuable. It, so it's not every census. It's 1850, 60, 70, and 80. Some state censuses in 1885, okay? But uh, they, they are amazing. You can get them for free on Family Search. Ancestry has them, of course. And I'm going to go ahead and close a few of these things. Perfect. And it's for naturalization. In the United States, what is the naturalization process and what records, I should say, are useful for genealogy? What records useful for genealogy are produced? And these people go to the wrong place thinking they're going to find them uh, maybe at National Archives, and it's not always the case. Uh, now, they do have a great article on naturalization records. But keep in mind that a lot of uh, the process started at the U.S. District Court. Uh, that is where you will find a lot of stuff. So I would start with the NARA page, National Archives. It would go through. Usually what you had to do is you had to do first do a declaration uh, and renouncing your citizenship. The ones for Germany are great because it says I, I am no longer subject to the Kaiser. Uh, and then you went through a process where then you got your naturalization and citizenship certificate, okay? See, National Archives will not have a copy of the certificate. Uh, and so uh, all of this, it, it walks you through how to find that. These are, you had to go to court, you had to swear and testify. And so that's why NARA did not have that. So it would be probably uh, Southern District, USDC Southern District for New York, for a lot of people that came into Ellis Island and who wound up staying there in New York. Always for occupation. How do you find a description from an occupation, especially one from the 18th or 19th century? Do you know what a cooper is? Well, cooper is a barrel maker. That's why the last name, cooper. What is a farrier? If you don't know, that's basically someone who shoes horses. Family, uh, family researcher, not family search. This is a free site. They have an amazing dictionary of old occupations from A to Z. Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, it's unbelievable, you know? So yeah, what's a bodger? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna go and see. A bodger is a chair maker. These are very English based, so there's a bias here. Uh, this is a site out of the UK. But if I see something on a record, it has an occupation that I don't know, what the heck is a bell maiden? Uh, surface worker at a tin mine. You know, I wouldn't know these things. Uh, so this is really a great resource. Uh, so it's uh, the Dictionary of Old. They also have a book on Amazon. It runs, I think, about $3.99. It's really not that expensive. P is for plat map or plat book. Do you know what this is? I had to learn this. How is a plat map or a plat book useful for genealogical research in the U.S.? Well, plat books basically were... Uh, you either had state land or federal land. Uh, if you don't know the Homestead Act of 1862 signed by President Lincoln, it released federal land all the way out to, you know, uh, the, the West Coast. But people that wanted the 60 acres, they had to prove, they had to apply and prove that they had improved the land and they had to build a house or a building on it. And so once plot maps would land, they'd map out and number the plots on this. Uh, and then sometimes you will actually see, uh, basically here, see the names uh, and who owns it. And these are amazing. It's amazing to see. Uh, there are plat books that are out there. Uh, Library of Congress has a lot. Family Search has a lot. Uh, and so then there are maps as well. So it can be a complicated process. It does. There's a high learning curve on it. Uh, but the thing is, this is a great starter article. Uh, especially if you have Midwest settlers, people that left New York, 
uh, and they settled in the Midwest, and you wonder, were they homesteaders, or where was their land, or maybe they bought it from somewhere else, it will be recorded in a plat book. Suppose that. It was for query. What's a query? Well, back when I started, I started in 1977, before the internet, uh, before the IBM PC, before software, uh, we had microfilm and sound decks. And query, query is when you had a question, you were trying to find someone, an ancestor, and you would have it printed in a, a newsletter, a monthly newsletter like Everton's Genealogical Helper. Uh, they've gone modern now. Uh, if you've ever used Ancestry Message Board, that's a query. You say, I'm looking for anyone, uh, descendants of Robert Austin born uh, North uh, Kingstown, Rhode Island, 1832, my ninth great grandfather. Uh, you could go ahead and do that. And guess what? Facebook, that is the biggest area for queries right now. I would go ahead and follow certain genealogical societies, or maybe on Facebook, there's a German genealogy group I belong to. And I can say, I'm trying to find Henneberg's from Leipzig in Saxony, uh, left 1891. And that's what a query is, because sometimes we need to go and out to that network and get a little bit of help there. R is for return. Uh, what is a marriage return? And is it the same as a marriage certificate? This doesn't exist in every state. It does exist here in Illinois. A marriage return is this. Let's say you get a license for marriage, and then the uh, pastor or the officiant, uh, you know, the rabbi, whatever, signs that. But a lot of times they also had to fill out the bottom of the form that was cut off and mailed back to vital records that's, that attested that they actually did this so that there was an index. Very often there are indexes of marriage returns if you didn't know about this. Back to the evidence explained site and it goes through, uh, a rare marriage record is a marriage record is a marriage record not. Uh, so a return is not necessarily a marriage record, it's an index. Someone usually had to take that information and transcribe it. Uh, but if you wanted to know what a return is, uh, go ahead and read this article. It's really interesting. I knew nothing about it a few years ago. S is for Social Security Death Index, SSDI. What's the SSDI? How can it be accessed? And are the records available for use in genealogy research? Uh, Social Security Death Index. Uh, Ancestry has a database. Genealogy Bank, which is a historical newspaper site, has one. And basically what it is, is when someone dies, that information is recorded. It was set up so that banks and insurance companies could verify a social security death, a social security number, and whether that person was deceased. We've all heard about how people would steal. Uh, they go to the obituaries, someone just died, uh, and you know the reporting takes a time, and then they use that social security number for fraud purposes. Uh, so, but the nice thing is, for our purposes, it gives us a lot of information, such as the location of the death. It has the birth date. Uh, so this goes through the whole process here. Uh, and so the resources are here. Uh, Ancestry, MyHeritage, they have the index online. Uh, also at Ancestry, let's see if this works. Uh, genealogy powers engage. Yes, yes. So I'm going to go ahead and do... Uh, hmm. I wonder if my mom's in here. I, let's see if she is. And we'll go ahead and do this. And uh, probably not. Uh, but it will go through this, and you can view the record for this person. And look, it gives you the birth date. It gives you their last residence. It doesn't mean that they died there. It gives you your death date. Uh, and so it gives you the SSI number. So this is a good starting point. This is one of the largest record sets for US research, and it's a great starting point. T is for timelines. I love timelines. Uh, how can a timeline help you with your genealogy research? Well, the thing is, it can actually fill in the gaps. When you look at a timeline, you can say, oh, between you know uh, Gustav Henneberg, I have his 1905 New York census, but why don't I have his 1915 or his 1925? The man died in 1942. Well, then it goes to my to-do list. Uh, there's a great article at thought.co, uh, thoughtco. This is owned by the New York Times. Uh, this it used to be about.com. 
Uh, and basically, it shows you how timelines work. Uh, I use one called Time Toast. Let me see if I can get this. Yay. Let's see if it'll let me log in. Oh, I know. Don't you hate remembering passwords? There we go. I have built all of these timelines for my research. Okay. And I'm going to go to this one for Gustav Henneberg. What it does is it gives me a visual. There it is. Look at that. This is when he was born. Oh, he arrived in eight, he, he arrived in 1890. Look, I have him in the 1900 U.S. Census. Have him in 1905. Uh, I have him, but I don't have the 1915. See, it, it gives you a lot of times when you work with data that's flat or in a spreadsheet, it's hard to visualize where the gaps are. So that's why you want to use different types of timeline programs. One thing is that Ancestry, My Heritage, Legacy Family Tree, Roots Magic, Family Tree Maker, they all have timelines built in right now. And I encourage them to use them, I encourage you to use them. U is for unclaimed mail notice. If you don't know this, how can you use data from an unclaimed mail notice for genealogy research? Does this notice have another name? If you're a fan of historical newspapers like I am, you may notice a column in the classifieds call, uh, called uh, waiting, mail waiting at the letters waiting at the post office. Remember, you know, there was no email here. If you were visiting maybe for the summer in a resort area like the Catskills, you had mail sent to general delivery under your name. They were not going to ring you up, especially if there wasn't a telephone, and let you know, hey, we have mail for you. So what they did is they took this. Uh, letters of our ancestors, they took out notices every week and they say, we are sitting on the following mail. What is that? How does that help you? It actually puts that person in a place within a specific date range. Oh, get out of here. Within a specific date range. And this is great in between census years. So a uh, great article here on, you know, basically how the mail system worked. But here, letters in the post office. This one is 1765. Uh, but yeah, it is amazing. Uh, uncollected mail, a list of letters remaining in the post office, Springfield, Illinois, 1842. So it means that someone had intended to be there or maybe was in that area around that time. Uh, pretty amazing. Again, one of those things I never knew about. B is for vertical files. What is a vertical file? You know what a vertical file is? Well, you might find them at libraries if they have a genealogy collection, definitely as some archives and repositories. What types of repositories hold vertical files? Well, I gave that answer away. What information do they hold and how did they get their name? Well, vertical files, files are named after a vertical file cabinet. Basically, it's folders, usually with family names, surnames. It's a catch-all for things that just didn't get classified or bound uh, and it could be ephemera, it could be things like announcements, maybe someone's a dance card from senior prom, believe it or not. Uh, and so this, I believe, is an article. I don't know if I wrote this one or a colleague did. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is, they are, oh, uh, Melissa Barker, who's known as the archive lady, a good friend of mine. Uh, she is the goddess of vertical files. And look, you can find a lot of different things, newspaper clippings, so when you go to a repository or a library, always ask, do you maintain vertical files? Uh, sometimes you will have to give them a name and they'll bring it to you. Sometimes you just go and look at the stuff. And it's pretty amazing what is there. W is for WorldCat. Uh, props to my librarians. Uh, what is WorldCat and how can it be used for genealogy research? Well, WorldCat is also known as interlibrary loan. Let's say that you have a book. This is a free service. The interlibrary loan part may not be free, but yes, I accept all your cookies. Uh, I can go ahead and sign in. Please remember me. Uh, now comes the question. Will Google remember my password? Uh, please. Oh, yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Oh, shoot. Yeah, it's kind of clunky. Okay, so what if I was looking for a book like uh, David, uh, Descendants of David Putman, who is uh, one of my great-grandparents. Putman is an old Dutch name. 
I'm going to go ahead and look for it in books. What it will do, it will show you the bibliographical information right here. And if you go there, guess what? It will show you where you can find a copy. Wow. Well, there were only 100 printed, and guess who has one? Me. Uh, but I would have to go to the Family Search Library. Uh, but you can borrow it through your public library. Very often, these books, so don't go out. I never go out and I never buy books right away unless I really want to own it. Sometimes if I need it just for a few things, I'll go through WorldCat and borrow it. And then you can ask your local library. And sometimes you have to use the book there at the public library, your local library. Sometimes you can take it home. X is for X marks the spot. What does it mean when there is an X in place of a signature? Well, under paleography, uh, X means it's a mark. It's usually someone who is illiterate, who didn't know uh, how to read and didn't know how to write their name. Library of Congress has a great guy on uh, mark versus signature. Uh, and so basically it was legal to do that and how it was supported. Uh, Judy Russell, the uh, legal genealogist, has a great article. Uh, basically, you know, see things like that, their marks or seal, someone would draw like a seal. And that's what that means when we say uh, X marks the spot. Why is for yearbooks? Are high school or college yearbooks useful for genealogy research? Are there other types of yearbooks? You bet. The best way to find a female maiden name is a yearbook. Uh, Family Tree Magazine has a nice article on yearbooks, and I'll give you a tip. Ancestry is a great collection. They were part of a lawsuit uh, in terms of whether they were copyrighted or not. And, and, uh, but the fact is that a lot of them never had the copyright notice, and so they are available. Uh, it's neat to look up your parents' yearbook. Uh, but the thing is, you can get home addresses for seniors. You can get maiden names and all of that. Uh, also, keep in mind, coming up in late August, back to school, Ancestry usually makes their yearbook uh, collection available for free. Uh, and this is an article, and it goes through uh, the sites that have yearbook collections. The other thing is that you might not know and see things like that. What you may not know is that sometimes medical associations, uh, fraternal organizations had yearbooks. The ones for, for dentists and for doctors are amazing. The one for Illinois Medical Association, uh, they have one every quarter, and then they did a yearbook, and they would list extensive obituaries. They would list uh, a doctor who was getting married, and they would have the female maiden name, her home address, where they were setting up their home after their honeymoon. So don't just think schools. It is high schools and universities, mostly in the US, but think of fraternal organizations. Uh, and they would do that. And those, a lot of those are available on Google Books. Getting done, we're coming close, and then I'll answer your questions. Z is for zip code. What does the term zip mean? This is a trick question. In zip code, what does it stand for? And when and why were they created? And are they used in genealogical research? Okay. Well, Library of Congress has a great guide on this. I remember Mr. Zippy. Uh, I remember the cutout in the post office urging people to use a zip code, okay? And it gives the, it stands for a zone improvement plan. It was a way, it was introduced in 1963. I mean, basically the volume of mail, you couldn't just write the town and the state. You know, where I grew up, you could. I didn't even have a, a street number. I lived in an RFD until the late 70s. That's how rural it was. But still, uh, zip codes are important. Uh, and this is great because now a lot of times they're used for uh, location when you're doing research on any of these sites. Uh, so yeah, and businesses, it gives the whole history uh, and uh, it, it's really kind of fun, uh, but you can use it. I can tell like a two zero zip code is Washington DC from when I went to college. I know when I lived in California, it started with nine. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that is uh, just a little bit of trivia there. Okay, so I'm going to come back. Uh, oh, I'm still on camera. I didn't realize that. Uh, this is my email if you want to contact me. Please don't be shy. I realize that a question may come to you, uh, you know, uh, 
afterwards. You can always email me. You have to give me about 48 hours to get back to you. I usually get two to 300 emails a day. I'm going to go ahead and put, uh, there we go, put the link to the syllabus in the chat. And I'll stop my share. And Lydia or Christy, do you want to come on and let me know? What did you think of this? Any takers? Oh my gosh, I thought it was wonderful. You know, okay. so many things. Um, yeah. I'm definitely going to be watching this again and take some more notes. And that's why I wanted you to record it. And I want you to use it as a resource, all the libraries for your patrons, because it's one of those things. And the, P and the PDF, download the PDF uh, and please do that. And uh, like I said, I believe in actionable education. You should have a takeaway whenever you sit through a webinar. So uh, I don't know if there are any questions out there. And Hillary, I know Hillary, she said zone improvement plan. Thanks for putting that in. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, what I've given you are a lot of resources, uh, and uh, maybe you didn't know about them. Lydia, were there a few that you didn't know about? Definitely. There were a yeah. few that I did not yeah. know about. Um, like I said, I'm going to go back and, and look yeah. at them. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you for mentioning the archives in the in archives um, in the beginning. Archive Grid. Archive, yeah, grid, archive grid is amazing. Is wonderful. It is, and it actually covers Australia and Canada as well. A lot of people don't know that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Chrissy, what about you, Chrissy? Did you have any? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can talk if you want. Yeah. Oh, you have to allow her to unmute. Um, Bia does have a question. Oh, okay. sure. Bia yeah. says, where do you start if your family is from Europe and came to the U.S. in 1947? Well, first thing is 1950 census. I mean, right? And that's just freshly new. I would start with that. Uh, and that you can get on Family Search. You can get it on My Heritage, even on Ancestry. I think it still might be free. Uh, so I would start with that. Then, in terms of, you have to figure out were they naturalized? Did they become citizens? So you have to find out where did they land. Uh, you can probably find the passenger list. Uh, uh, and you have to figure out where they came in. Did they come into Boston, Philadelphia, New York, New Orleans? Uh, and then that would be the court district, possibly, where they filed for their naturalization. So you start with that and you slowly work backwards. Uh, and then with Europe resources, I find that MyHeritage has some of the best European resources. They have also have a lot of members from Europe. I know there are uh, message boards for German research that has helped me with my Hennebergs. But again, I would start with the 1950 census. If anyone has passed away, uh, within the past five years, look them up in the Social Security Death Index, uh, do newspaper research. You know, there's no easy button in genealogy. It's all about piecing this together and working your way through and keeping a to-do list, you know, and because uh, I'll see like a, a naturalization certificate and, oh, his occupation was this. If I don't write it down and say, I'm going to go research his occupation, then it goes out of my head. So that's a great question. So, and thank you, Eileen, as well. Uh, yeah, this has been great. And uh, there is a lot of information here. And uh, sometimes I think it's just use, useless information. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is a fun way. When I was telling Lydia before we started, when I do this in person at a conference, uh, this is actually participatory like Jeopardy. Uh, and so, yeah, we do this. And uh, through a process of elimination and scoring, the person that gets the most wins usually a door prize, but I have no door prizes to give out, so. <laughs> I think um, uh, your handout is so valuable that I think that I'm making copies for, uh, to give out to patrons in the library when they yeah. do any yeah. genealogy I'm gonna research. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. I do wanna show you one thing here is uh, I have a site called uh, Genealogy Bargains and librarians, you should know this. Uh, I have, well, I do have a free ebook on Kindle that's free today and tomorrow, 500 Best Genealogy and Family History Tips. The name of the site is Genealogy Bargains. But look at this, Christy. I have over 40 free cheat sheets. These are PDF, two-sided. A lot of libraries will print these out on cardstock, and you're allowed to do that and give them away to patrons. You know, oh, I, I know you. that it's challenging. I've worked with the American Library Association Genealogy Committee. I've actually taught at some of the conferences. And they're saying, you know, sometimes we don't know uh, where to point patrons in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so I've got things like genealogy, staying safe online, uh, transportation resources, you know, all of this stuff. 
And uh, so these are totally free word shortcut keys. And, uh, and so, you know, what they are is they're formatted like this. They're always two-sided and they're easy to print out and they almost always have a great resource list. So please do that. Again, the site is uh, Genealogy Bargains, which is my site and uh, free genealogy cheat sheets. So great. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You so You're welcome. So I'll stop my share. Anything else before I go and make dinner? It's almost seven here in Chicago. <laughs> We're having meatloaf and brown gravy and vegetables tonight. Anyone want to stop by? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if no one else has other questions, um, I guess we're going to call it an evening and let Thomas go make dinner. Yeah, and hopefully we'll work again soon, especially on genealogy escape room or something like that. That would be perfect. Okay, awesome. Sis does have a question. Sis, sure. how do you keep items like business cards, legends, or business credit? Yeah, I scan almost everything. You want to unmute yourself and ask sure, go ahead. verbally? Yes, Sis. You have to unmute. We can't hear you. See. There you go. I have from my grandfather. He said his ledger, he had a grocery store. Right. And 95% of the month where he wrote down what they spent are marks. He knew the names. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And when he passed away, he didn't bother telling any of us. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Well, what should I do with the whole book? Well, where is it from? Where where was he living? Where's the grocery store? Where 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 Newport, is it? Newport News, Virginia. Virginia, down in the Hampton Roads area. Great. So what I do when I find these things, I always scan them myself. I have a flatbed scanner. I have an app called Reimagine by My Heritage, uh, so that at least I have an image. And then I usually donate these items uh, to a historical society. They might be interested or something like that. Also, if I have the time, then I'll transcribe it. Uh, that way I give the transcription to the library or the historical society or genealogy society along with that. I am a steward for my family history. I can't take these objects with me. So I want them to live beyond me. And that's what I usually do with everything. I mean, I'm sitting here on right now. This is one of them. My mother maintained this book called School Years for me with geeky photos and report yeah. cards and I'm in the process of scanning this and I probably will donate it to Liberty Central School where I grew up in Liberty it's one of the things or the historical society for Sullivan County you know and uh it, it's great it's a blessing I don't like looking at some of the photos but my mother <laughs> wrote down who my teacher was uh all of that information it's amazing so you have to think about that think of yourself as a steward for this information and how is this going to live on beyond you you know, and that's that's the important part. So that's what I would do, sis, if I had it. Now, understanding who those people were, you might want to do historical newspaper research in that area and that time in Newport News. Uh, maybe he had a, an ad for his grocery business, but that's going to be a difficult one. And the other thing is like business cards that have uh, my father owned a grocery store, uh, right. a furniture store. Sure. And I have you know, the payment because right. this during Second World War. Yeah. And before the Second World War. Yeah. So just yeah. should I copy a few of them? I, I would, I would, dig I digitize everything. Remember I talked for V's for vertical files. Remember I mm -hmm. told you some archives and libraries have vertical files. What you're talking about right now is perfect material for a vertical file. A library someplace will want that stuff and do that. And uh, yeah, I, I'm sitting on a box to my shame underneath my desk that has diary pages and it has receipts. It has a dance card from my great grandmother in 1915 before she got married. Uh, and so these are precious, uh, 